Hello everyone, a warm welcome back to the channel. Uh, as promised, and I've been eagerly looking forward to this because I do enjoy this game very much, I am going to be doing a setup and playthrough um, of at least part of a game of Iron Bottom and Sunset Sky. So I'm going to begin with the setup phase because, of course, both sides start with their home bases, Truck Lagoon for Japan, Espirito Santo for the United States. Now, this is the historical setup. So you can see that there's not actually much in the way of symmetry there. The US has better repair facilities, they draw more cards. To offset this, the Japanese have a somewhat stronger starting um, hand, in fact significantly stronger. Um, they draw 12 cards and get 18 points worth of ships and bases. By contrast, the US only draws three aircraft cards and gets 12 points of ships and bases. So that is a, a it, there are strengths and weaknesses to both sides. The Japanese begin with more units. The US has greater strength in the long term. If you wanted to play a fairer game, you could flip them on their side. And you'd find that although there was still something of an imbalance, they, they're never going to get away from the US superiority in anti-aircraft strength. On the, on the reverse or tournament side, the numbers are broadly equal. So um, minor tweak there. I tend to play the historical side up because I prefer that, even though it can be a bit imbalanced. So both sides have their home locations. I suppose if we're sticking to where east and, and uh, who, who had the east and west positions, um, Truck Lagoon should be over there and Espiritu Santo should be over there. So both sides also have their strategic bases, Port Moresby for the Allies and Rabaul for the Japanese. I'll put those there for now next to their home bases. Although, as you can see from the bar at the top, your strategic base can either be in your middle line or your front line. Now, if no other bases are drawn in the initial setup, then these will end up in the front line. But let's see what happens. So, Japanese will first draw their 12 card aircraft and similar cards. And not unexpectedly, they have a nice chunky starting hand of air assets and supporting units. We'll look at those in detail in a second. Now, as they begin with 18 points worth of cards from their fleet deck, I'll show you how this works. You draw cards and look at the points value. So one for that destroyer group. Four makes it five that they've drawn so far. There's a base there. Seven. Eight. Thirteen. Carrier Junior was turned up. Sixteen. Pair of Congos. Seventeen. And, ooh, Kavieng, another airfield. Now, obviously with that card we've gone over 18 for the Japanese, but that doesn't matter. It's not a problem if you end up with a total higher than your starting uh, allowance. It's just the moment a card makes you cross that line, then you stop drawing. So the Japanese look at what they've got. Um, and Rabaul will be in the middle line because they have two bases, which can they can deploy immediately. So I'll just put Kavieng down there and lie next to it to show that both those bases are in the Japanese front line. Um, I might have to shuffle them over a bit because I may, may need the space. So there we go. Not a bad start for the Japanese. The rest of their ships will be in a fairly disorganized mass. Well, not disorganized, but they've not been organized into formations. So they will begin the game at truck. 
in the Japanese rear line. And lastly, the Japanese have a reasonable number of uh, aircraft. Those are events. Events are double double use cards. You can either use them for the unit or for the event. So I'll explain what they are as I go through the game. Uh, otherwise, as you can see, it's lots of different aerial assets and how these are used will make a bit more sense when things get underway. So what about the allies? They have an allowance of 12 for ship and base cards. So let's see what they end up with. Four, not a bad start. Eight, oh, they might burn through their allowance very quickly. Nine. 10, 11, 12, that's, that's all they begin with. So there are no bases there, which means unfortunately for the Allies, Port Moresby is squarely in the firing line. Nothing between it and Espiritu Santo. And the US, they've got two carriers, a group of destroyers and a battleship. Not quite the level of strength they uh, were wanting, but there we go. And they're three aircraft cards. They do start in a fairly weak position. So they have they have two carrier aircraft and an event card or an invasion transport card. So play is ready to begin now. Now each turn you get a series of phases and once the initial phases are done, the player has a choice to make. Um, three critical choices. They can either do nothing, reorganize and draw another card, um, or they can launch limited airstrikes, no, no sea or land element, just the airstrikes, or they can, they can go for a full-out assault upon one of the enemy bases in the band closest to them. So at the moment, let's say if the Allies were in a position to launch a full-on landing, their only options would be Lae or Kavieng. They wouldn't be able to touch uh, Rabaul for the moment. They'd have to break the outer perimeter first. Um, unfortunately, um, if the Japanese were coming the other way, Port Moresby is right there as a big inviting target. Now, one of the sudden death victory conditions is that if you lose your strategic base, then it's game over. So. The Japanese uh, can feel a bit more comfortable about their position than the Allies can. But I won't get too far ahead of myself. Let's move through the Allied turn. So the first thing that happens is the reinforcement phase. And if you have any event cards that allow reinforcement, now is the time to play them. Um, the US player unfortunately does not. So he skips the reinforcement phase. The next is um, ship movement. So um, seeing that he has two um, carrier aircraft in hand, he decides it might be worth committing a bit of strength. So he's going to send the stronger of his two aircraft carriers forward. That's, uh, that's poor little USS Wasp, not, not quite up to the standards of an Enterprise-class carrier. So the logical thing is to send it out with some destroyer escorts. Now, some ship units, particularly destroyer groups, have these little pluses on them, which means that they can be combined with another unit and effectively treated as one card. So while they're attached to their parent carrier, they um, give it a plus one bonus, um, if the carrier had the ability to fight on the surface, which it doesn't, they would have given it a torpedo rating. Crucially, they give it an anti-submarine rating and they boost its survivability. Now, when you move ships and deploy aircraft, normally for concealment from your opponent, they are deployed face down. So there's a huge element of bluff and guessing in this game. What I'm going to do, because I'm basically soloing it, um, is I'm going to denote um, hidden units by having them um, the right way up. When they become spotted, 
I will turn them upside down. This is just for everyone's benefit so you can keep track of what units are where and what they're up to. So a safe place when you're organizing your fleet is to have aircraft carriers in the second line. So that's the fleet reserve, that's the middle, and that's the fleet's outer line. The reason that's a safe place to put your carriers is because the outer screen, as you can imagine, is the most vulnerable. So, cleverly, while this game conforms to the idea of, of how you compose and build your task force, it also blends it in with the concept of range as defined by the placement of the base cards. That might sound a bit gobbledygooky, but it will make sense, I promise. And lastly, just in case, he's going to take the risk of committing the battleship. He doesn't have enough destroyers to escort both, so the battleship's going to have to take care of itself. So the ships have moved. The next stage is aircraft deployment. So he is going to he's going to deploy his aircraft. Both of them. You see the carrier has a capacity of two aircraft. Both of these are going to go on the carrier. Now, when you deploy aircraft on a carrier that's face down, you place the aircraft face down as well. So all it tells the opposing player is that one of your concealed ships is an aircraft carrier. Now, the US player has a choice with this one. He can either play it as a transport is it worth the risk of trying to knock out a Japanese base right from the beginning or retain it? That event card is steep bombing angle. And what it allows the US player to do is if his airstrike is intercepted by a combat air patrol, his dive bombers can avoid, if they conduct a dive bombing attack, they can avoid the combat air patrol. They do not get attacked by it. So that's quite a powerful card in the US player's arsenal. And he is, to be perfectly honest, um, in he, it's going to be a tough decision because the advantage of the US player going first is they catch the Japanese on the hop. No one's deployed. They don't have any assets down. If the US gets in a successful punch early, it gives them a respectable lead, but it's risky. It's very, very risky. Does this sound a bit like Operation Shoestring? I think the designer intended it to feel that way. Um, after some deliberation, the US player decides he's not ready to risk an amphibious invasion. He can always change his mind later in the game, but for now he's going to hang on to this card because it could be useful. So the next stage is reconnaissance. Now, he doesn't really have any recon units in play. Both the SBD and the Avenger are capable of recon. The Dauntless is somewhat better at it. Um, but they both have a range of three off a carrier, which means they can go no further than Rabaul in game terms. And there are no Japanese units here. The only ones that they could potentially scout are over there and they're out of range. So he won't do any scouting this turn. And he also decides, now that it's come to the main, the main phase, so he can either, just to recap, do nothing. And in, in doing nothing, he can reorganize all his forces. Um, no point doing that on the, or that on turn one, he's quite happy with his deployment. He would also draw another card if he chose to take that decision. Um, I've just realised I forgot the most important part of the turn. At the beginning of the turn, the US player would have drawn three additional cards. I'll do that now with many apologies for forgetting that. Now, because he's taken actions this turn, I will assume he discarded one of the three cards which he decided he didn't want. Um, because I've skipped the reconnaissance step, let's just say that because he has such a dearth of combat aircraft, he's decided he'll ditch the Catalina. Painful decision, but maybe worth it? Time will tell. Anyway, back to his decision in game terms. Um, um, he could have deployed these aircraft during that phase, 
but I won't do it this turn. I forgot, so it would just have to let the poor American player be penalised on turn one for, for my bad thinking. Never mind, doesn't hurt to have aircraft in reserve. And to be honest, I'm rather reluctant to risk P-39s unless I have to, because they, they're pretty much cannon fodder with some ability to shoot back. So he's decided that he will go down the middle road. He won't launch an all-out invasion. He can't anyway, because he didn't play the transport as a card during the uh, deployment phase. But he is going to launch a limited air attack. Now, there's not much to choose between the bases at um, Lae and Kavieng, so he decides he's going to throw in an air attack to just give the Japanese a bit of a jolt over there. Now, looking through his hand, the Japanese player has no event cards that can prevent such a thing from happening, and because the US has taken them by surprise, with this totally unexpected offensive in the South Pacific, um, they are caught with only their own defences. So... Now I'll demonstrate how air-to-ground combat works. The Dauntlesses will go in first. They roll two dice. Get those two. Um, Anti-aircraft fire is simultaneous. The base has a zero rating for anti-aircraft, which means one dice. Now, if your rating is one or better, on a roll of four... You don't hit anything, but you get to re-roll next round. On a five, you score one hit, and on a six, you score two. That's how you assess damage to bases. Air units are knocked off on a single hit, so they can be quite vulnerable. When you're firing with a rating of zero, a six is a hit, no other number has any effect. So the Dauntlesses have a significant advantage. Let's see what happens. I'll roll them all together. Red dice for the Japanese, blue for the US. Okay, so the Japanese anti-aircraft fire is ineffective. The two is a miss and the Dauntless doesn't get another go with that dice. The six, however, represents two hits on the base. And the Dauntless can roll that dice again with no comeback from the anti-aircraft gun. So very happily, the US player rolls again. A four is no hit, but he can roll yet again. A six. Oh my goodness, this pilot's on the ball. So the base is up to four damage points. And he gets to roll again. He's doing well. Ah, a one. Okay. The Dauntless Squadron has exhausted its offensive capabilities. I'll turn it on its side to show that it's gone. Um, and now the Avengers are boring in. Now, because it's a new attack, the base's AA does get to fire again. Normally, hits would reduce the statistics of a base or a ship, but because the anti-aircraft rating is already zero, it's already at that base minimum. So, like the Dauntless, because it's a, a, a bombing raid on a land target, the Avengers roll two dice against the Japanese one. Let's see what happens. Ooh, that was awful. The Japanese flak missed completely, and so did the Avengers. And because they rolled less than a three inclusive, they don't get second chances on those. So... They came so close to knocking out that Japanese base and landing themselves a respectable amount of victory points right at the start of the game, but Lady Luck was not with them. So these otherwise triumphant air squadrons return to their parent carrier because no, no other air strikes or any form of offensive actions taking place. So we'll go straight to the return phase. And when they land on their carrier they would land in a hidden state because the Japanese have no idea where that carrier force is. Those planes have come out of nowhere. And that ends the first US turn. So moving to the Japanese, they draw two cards. Now on turn one, they are not going to hang on to them. 
The reason for that is the maximum um, hand size limit in this game is six cards. The Japanese are allowed to start with 12 and draw two, but they must deploy or discard down to six, and it would be a huge waste if the Japanese had to discard a lot of these cards. So they've drawn a zero naval fighter and a Val naval dive bomber. And they decide that because they already have a fair number of fighters, they're going to take the painful decision to discard the zero. One of the many painful logistical choices you have to make. So the first stage in the turn is reinforcement. And they do have a couple of reinforce, at least one reinforcement card that has, oh yes, it is just the one. So that means roll a dice and draw um, ship cards or base cards equal to the result you roll. So a bit like the first deployment, but it'll be anything between one and six reinforcement points. Now they don't have to use it this phase because they could hang on to it to deploy it as a submarine later. See, lots of tough choices this game forces upon you. The Japanese decide they're going to do it because you can never have too many ships and bases, so why not? So they have just rolled a four. That's not too bad. So that card is now discarded. And looking at their reinforcements, they get a three. Ooh, more Congos. Goodness. And, ooh. A Shokaku-class aircraft carrier. Okay, that's uh, that's very significant. The new units arrive at truck. Next, it's movement of ships. Now, the Japanese have a lot of naval assets. I mean a lot. Um, so they need to think about this. They've got a lot of capital units. I'm going to separate out the destroyers to just see what their choices are. So they've got three destroyer escort units, or escorting destroyer units, I should say. They have two fleet carrier units available. So let's have a think. Two fleet carriers with a total capacity of four naval aircraft. Oh, they definitely have that many. Okay. So what's going to happen is... The carriers will definitely be going to sea. And each one will be given a destroyer escort. Because these are high value units, you want to look after them. So the Japanese carriers will put to sea. As for their surface ships, they'll also rather ambitiously put all the Congos and those heavy cruisers in the front rank. Um, they only have one squadron of destroyers available now, um, so they're going to attach it to one of the Congos to give it a bit more survivability. Go and find these impudent people who've bombed one of their bases. So that's quite a bit of strength the Japanese have got out and about now. Now it's the time to deploy aircraft. So I'm going to start with the carriers. This will probably require a bit of thought and planning. Now I tend to like, when I'm playing this game, getting a balanced force of dive bombers, torpedo bombers and escorting zeros. But of course the, the cumulative total of carrier capacity is four cards. So I'm going to give... Um, I'm going to give the Junyo over there a zero and a, a zero squadron and a Val squadron. And I think I will give the Shokaku the, the torpedo bombers, the Kates, and another zero squadron. That seems a fairly respectable mix. Now, the Japanese, in their starting hand, are also blessed with a couple of float planes. Um, the fighter reconnaissance F-1M Pete and the very capable E-13A Jake search planes. So, 
the cruisers or the battleships could carry these. So I am thinking if I were the Japanese, it doesn't hugely matter, but as the cruisers squish marginally more easily, a safer home for the float planes would be the battleships. So distribute them like so. Now this leaves us with quite a number of aircraft looking for a home. So this can be a bit of a headache deciding what to put where, but I think it is reasonable to place a bomber of some sort close to the American fleet. So this is where the significance of the US attack last turn comes in. They did not knock out Lae, but they've damaged it severely enough to render it unable to support aircraft this turn. So the Japanese cannot base any aircraft there this round. So they're going to put a torpedo bomber squadron in at Kavieng. And they are going to... They're going to put all three of their remaining bomber units. That's two squadrons of VALs and a squadron of the long-range G4M Betty bombers over here at Rabaul. Lastly, call it a backstop position really, the last available squadron of zeros will go to truck. So that's an immense amount of power the Japanese have to deploy on turn one. I'll just shove these fellows up a bit so you can see them on the camera. The last card they have is another split card. So they could have that as an invasion transport. It's tempting. In theory, they don't know what that naval unit is that's hovering around off Port Moresby. But whatever it is, they know the US has only got one of them, whereas they have a significant battle fleet at sea backed by an awful lot of carrier and land-based aircraft. So it's tempting to chuck this at um, Port Moresby, but it could go wrong. And if it goes wrong, they will lose this. There are not that many transport cards in the game. So the Japanese decide that they're going to hang on to it. They're going to be prudent like their American foes. Also, as ever, that's a very useful event card. That is fog, and that actually prevents uh, an airstrike from finding a targeted fleet unit. Basically, it cancels the attack, so that can be very handy, and the Japanese are going to keep that card in reserve. So, we come to reconnaissance, and unlike the Allies in the previous turn, the Japanese have very well placed to conduct some recon. They decide they're going to keep all their combat assets in a combat role for now, but they do have a dedicated search aircraft in the form of the Jake. So they're going to be fairly unambitious about what they do. The Jake is dispatched on a mission. Its range is three, so it can easily reach the adjacent area. They want to find out what that battleship is. Now, had the Allies any fighters in the area, they could at this point have intercepted the Jake and tried to shoot it down before it could make its report. But sadly, they do not have any fighters, so they're going to have to just um, deal with it. I've just realised I've forgotten another phase again. The repair phase. That happens immediately before reconnaissance. So, as the Japanese have a damaged base... Normally, if you had damaged ships, you would roll on your bases, your home base's repair capacity, and any damaged ships in your reserve could attempt to repair damage. Bases are automatically repaired at the beginning of your turn. Now, note the cleverness of the timing. Repairs happen after aircraft deployment, so damage suffered the previous turn directly affects your ability to reinforce a base. But anyway, sorry for forgetting that step. Let's get on with the aerial reconnaissance. The Jake has a recon value of two, and it's going to try and find out what it can see. Ooh, okay. The two was no good, but the five allows it to reveal the presence of a US battleship 
all on its own. Now, what are the Japanese to do? The obvious thing would be to launch an airstrike. And I think they'd be foolish not to, so let's go for it. I'm just going to move the scout plane out of the way because its role in this is temporarily finished. With air combat, things happen in, sta in, in, in I go, you go stages. So it's a raid. The Japanese are going to start off cautiously. They're going to order the torpedo bomber squadron to take off from Kavieng to intercept intercept the newly sighted battleship. The US are not going to respond immediately. They could launch a strike now at, at any target in response to that first Japanese aerial movement, but they're going to hold off for now. The Japanese have no idea where that ship is or where its planes are, and maybe they don't want to reveal their hand just yet. Also, there's a lot of force on the table, so it it's very clever of the US to want to wait and see what the Japanese are up to before committing a strike. So the Japanese, hoping to draw a response from the Americans, are slightly disappointed there. So they decide they're going to up the ante a tiny bit. Now, aware that there's no fighter escort there, they'll send up the squadron from Junyo, the dive bombers and the fighter, to go and join that strike. The US decide they're going to respond. They remember that they have this handy card in their hands and they're tempted to use it. What they are going to do is try and distract the Japanese by resuming their bombing attack on Lae. That's potentially a threat the Japanese cannot ignore and they are correct. The Japanese order the fighter squadron at truck, somewhat implausibly given the range, but that's how this game works. They can move two spaces. Remember, if the range is underscored, it means that taking off from a land base, it, the, rate, the outbound range is reduced by two. But they can still reach that US force, so they intercept it. The US has no further air units, so they're not going to commit anything else. So the Japanese decide that just for insurance, to make sure a high-profile target like that is actually sunk, they're going to commit all the air forces from Rabaul as well. But they're going to stop there. There is such a thing as overkill in this game. And you don't want to risk unnecessary casualties among your aircraft by overdoing it. So let's start with the combat here first. Normally the phasing player, the player whose turn it is, would decide. The Japanese want to see what the outcome of this little strike is. So the zeros close in on the incoming US formation. Normally, around this time, the two players would begin tasking. So by tasking, you sort the aircraft in your hand out. The assumption is everyone's still face down and nobody knows the composition of the other side's air group. The attacker would sort aircraft into escorts, escorting fighters if you had any, and bombing, um, uh, basically, uh, um, air, air raid aircraft, the bombers who are going to be slinging bombs. The defenders would divide their aircraft into two groups as well. Air superiority, whose job is to attack the fighter escorts, and interceptors, whose job is to shoot down the bombers. Now, before things get to that stage, the US player decides he's going to play that event card, which nullifies the Japanese ability to interfere anyway. So that card goes away, the zeros end up milling helplessly. Now, of course, the dive bomber can go in with no problem. For that card to protect the Grummans, they have to... Um... Oh, no, sorry, because they're conducting a land attack. No, it covers both of them. So they are fine. They ignore the Japanese cap and they go in. However, they are both still susceptible to flak. 
So if I do what I did before, and I'll do the dauntlesses, the dauntlesses first. Two dice for the US, one dice for the Japanese. US scores two hits and they have a reroll, the Japanese miss. So two hits there. Dauntlesses continue their attack. Another hit and they get a reroll again. They might single-handedly do this. Another hit and another re-roll. So just as a recap, roll a four me is not a hit, but you can re-roll. A five is one hit and a re-roll. A six is two hits and a re-roll. So they do it. go in again. Ooh, um, that's done it. The squadron of dauntlesses has hit Lai so hard that for the purposes of this game, it is effectively out of operations. That gives the US player eight victory points. Victory points for bases are doubled if you knock them out. So the allies have just netted themselves eight VP. Unfortunately for them, because both air, you always have to declare your targets before any dice are rolled. And of course, when it comes to bases, you can only ever attack the one anywhere unless you order your squadrons to split up and go after different ones. So both had declared they were attacking Lae, and therefore the attack by the Avengers is, is wasted because the Dauntlesses have taken care of the target. So a very good start for the US forces and a very disappointing performance for the Japanese Zeros who completely missed the target. Let's now move to the attack on the US battleship and see whether the Japanese can redeem themselves. Now there's no top cover so or, there, or any kind of fighter defense so the Zeros really need not have bothered coming. Now when it comes to attacking naval targets it's always better to commit your dive bombers first because anti-aircraft combat works differently depending on, on uh, whether you're attacking with bombs or torpedoes. Dive bombers roll their dice simultaneously with the ship's anti-aircraft. Torpedo bombers have to endure anti-aircraft fire before they get their roll, so they can be quite vulnerable. So as a tactical move, you don't have to do this, but as a tactical move it makes good sense to commit your dive bombers first. So. We've decided the Zero can't do anything. There's no viable target for it. So Dive Bomber Squadron 1 is going to go in first. They get three dice. The US battleship gets one. I'll roll them all together. Ooh, okay. Both sides rolled pretty badly. However, the Dive Bomber got a six on one of its rolls. So that's two hits and they get to roll again. Ooh, another hit, and they get to roll again. Two more hits, and another re-roll. This is rather painful. Ah, they finally run out of puff. So they withdraw, having completed their attacks. And the next dive bomber squadron goes in. Because it's a new attacking squadron, the US ship's anti-aircraft guns can engage this target. But they're now treated as having an anti-aircraft rating of zero. So they're going to need all the luck they can get. I don't think they're going to make it. No, nope. more abysmal rolling from both sides. But that next Japanese hit is enough to sink the battleship. So the... Uh, the US triumph over flattening Lae is very short-lived as that South Dakota goes down and it goes into the Japanese victory point pile. However, what it's meant in practice is the vast majority of the Japanese raid achieves, well, nothing because their target was sunk before they had a chance to engage it. And the US significantly is still leading in victory points. So now it's all it's the return phase. All committed aircraft can go back where they came from. So the US squadrons return triumphantly to their carrier. The 
Zero Squadron from Truck Lagoon goes back home. Now, once they have um, once they have engaged, moved, whatever aircraft that were based on land bases are now revealed. So I'll turn them sideways to indicate that status. The ones that are returning to their carriers, like their US counterparts, is, are treated as being invisible. But everybody else, Torpedo Squadron going back to Kaviang, and the three squadrons based here at Rabaul, all go on their side, so the US knows exactly what's there now. The uh, Jake reconnaissance plane returns to its parent ship, so it's invisible. And that's it. Everyone's home. And that's the end of the Japanese turn. So we've had two complete turns for both sides. I'm going to swing back to the Americans now. So they draw three cards to complement what's already in their hand. Hmm, that's not too bad, actually. They are going to... They really like those cards that they have in hand. They really would like to keep all three of them. But that means voluntarily giving up their turn at a time when they're quite weak and quite vulnerable. But maybe that's the right time to do it, because none of their forces have been sighted. Um, so it might be worth keeping their heads down. They decide they're going to do it. They're going to keep all three cards they've drawn. And they will keep their heads down this turn. So moving back to the Japanese. They draw two cards. Unlike the US, because of their great preponderance of strength, they decide they want to do something. But that means they have to decide on one of these cards to get rid of. They've got an embarrassment of riches, relatively speaking, when it comes to bombers. So they feel they can give up the uh, G4M Betty. So now it comes to the reinforcement phase, but they have no reinforcement cards. Uh, moving if sh moving ships, they're happy with the deployment of all their ships at the moment. Um, deployment of aircraft. Now, they don't have a seaplane based at um, Rabaul just yet, so they're going to put the Mavis over there. Sorry, I should say flying boat, not seaplane. Now again, they return to this question, should they deploy this as an attack transport? It is tempting. They've removed the US battleship from its position protecting Port Moresby. And if they decide to descend on it this turn, they could well win the game. But, but it's chancy. And they're not quite sure they're ready to commit just yet. They need to soften soften the place up a bit first, or just destroy it by bombardment if they can. Uh, so they're going to hold fire on that this turn. And they're going to go to the reconnaissance phase. They now have two dedicated recon aircraft. Now the Jake, with its very impressive range, is going to fly all the way back here to see what's lurking in the US reserve area. And they're going to entrust the mission of sniffing out whatever's here to the Mavis. Again, no US fighters rise to intercept either scout plane, so they're going to do the Mavis's role first. It, unfortunately for the US, sights the carrier task force. That is not good. Not with the amount of power that's lurking nearby. As for the Jake, he has a very successful day. He sights the, uh, he sights poor little Wasp back there. So these two have done extremely well.
interesting question for the Japanese. They can either concentrate their forces for a definite hammering of somebody, or they can split their formidable resources and see what they do. They decide they're not going to go for any full-on invasion or bombardment again. It would be a bit pointless doing it because they decided to hang on to their tr invasion transport and not commit it. So what else can they do? The first order of business is to use their carrier strike aircraft. And they are going to use those on Port Moresby. The US player is not going to respond at this stage. The Japanese next commit the force from Kavieng, the torpedo bomber squadron, to the aircraft carriers, which are, well, this aircraft carrier, which is just within range. Again, no response from the US player. The Japanese are going to launch from their other carrier. And the target of this strike, again, they're going to pile the pressure on Port Moresby. Still no response from the US player. They are finally going to send not these two, Oh wait, yes, they will, because although the US carriers are out of range, they can still strike Port Moresby. So the Japanese are going to split their strike. They're going to send the Betty, because it has the range, out to attack the carrier. The US is going to respond now. Now they do have choices. They could simply take these off and fly them somewhere to keep them safe, which is what they're going to do. They're going to order them to take off, but they're going to give them a withdraw order. So they're not going to go off and try and bomb something. They're just going to get off the deck of that carrier because you really don't want to be caught on it if there's an airstrike incoming. The Japanese commit the Val squadrons from Rabaul to the formidable force that's trying to demolish Port Moresby. And lastly, for a good measure, they decide they're going to throw in that peat as well, because why not? They're going for broke on this one. So, the Japanese are most keen to see what happens in their massive attack on Port Moresby. So let's find out. They've got a huge force of aircraft. And in the interests of trying to weaken the base's anti-aircraft, they're going to send in the less valuable bombing units first, in the hope of gradually paring that formidable flak down. Now, the US has no cards in hand that can do anything about that. But then comfortingly, not that they know this, neither do the Japanese. So the first thing that's going to hit Port Moresby is going to be the squadron of peat float planes. Their bombing ground attack rating is zero, so that means one dice, needing sixes to hit. The allies of two, so they get these two, needing four or better to achieve anything, preferably a five or a six. Good shot. The peats miss and they are blown out of the sky by the flak. Not an encouraging start for the Japanese, but they had plenty more where that came from. The zeros come in on a flak suppression strafing run, maybe a few bombs as well, but more likely just uh, machine gun and cannon fire. They're somewhat better off than the peats in that they achieve something on a four or better. They actually score hits on a five or better. Let's see what happens. Ooh. Okay, that was some very righteous US flak there. Heavy losses among the first wave of zeros. 
no hits scored. The second wave comes boring in. Oh dear. Those achieve nothing, but the Americans can re-roll. Okay. That one didn't score any hits, but it got away with it and lived to tell the tale. Squadron of Vals coming in next. And it's two on two now. Okay, so the Vals score two hits on Port Moresby, but in return their squadron gets riddled by the ground fire. Next squadron of Vals coming in. They get two dice. The base has been reduced to one dice because of the two hits, so its AA rating is now effectively zero. Not bad. The Japanese get a further two hits, and they would have had a re-roll if the base hadn't shot them down as well. This is not a good day for the Imperial Navy. A group of Kates go in next. Okay, that's another hit. And they get a re-roll on one of their dice. No, that's a miss, so they have to withdraw as well. The last attacking squadron, group of Vals. No, no good for Port Moresby. They don't score a hit, but they get a re-roll. No, re-roll. And a miss. So, altogether, a costly and rather disappointing strike for the Japanese. I'll just stick the surviving planes there. But what about their attack on the carrier group? Because uh, I'll leave the scout out of it. Now, I've possibly made a deliberate mistake to illustrate how it can go wrong, but by some sheer mischance, or perhaps just poor planning, or perhaps an excessive faith in the efficacy of their torpedo aircraft, the Japanese have committed no bombers to the strike on the carrier. So they're going in with Bettys and Kates, and the Kates are going to go in first. Now remember I mentioned earlier that if it's a torpedo bomber attack, the anti-aircraft of the defending ships gets to fire first, and the Americans have a total of two because of the destroyers backing up the carrier's guns. So here they go, and that is a hit. The Kates bore in bravely against a wall of American flak, but I'm afraid the uh, Bushido spirit isn't quite up to the job of getting their planes through. But not deterred, the Bettys decide they're going to have a go. And it was worth it. The US flak, which was so effective against the Cates, has fluffed up against the Bettys. Their torpedo rating is four, so this could be devastating. Or not. A one, a one, and a three means nothing. And a four is a simple re-roll. And it fails. Oh, huge sigh of relief on the US flat top. Uh, as some very disappointed Japanese bank away. Golly, that had me on the edge of my seat for a while. So that's it for the air attacks. It's now the return phase. And it's a grim day on board the Japanese carriers, unfortunately, as none of the land-based aircraft return. And only a fraction of the squadrons that set out from the carriers do. It's rather grim. The damage to Port Moresby was not all that great in relation to the force committed. Uh, I suppose it's with equal grimness the Bettys return to Rabaul and the various reconnaissance units go home as well. So everyone has suffered losses in most of the Japanese formations. The US, those carrier aircraft, absolutely amazed that they still have a carrier to land on, put back down on their parent vessel. 
that was an astounding turn. I, I thought, I honestly thought it was going to be a walkover for the Japanese. Had they rolled a lot better, they might well have flattened Port Moresby and that would have been the game there and then. But they didn't. And in fact, they've badly weakened themselves doing it. And I think they still have a lot of strength, don't misunderstand me. But they're getting to the point where they're going to have to start calling on their powerful surface units because their aircraft have suffered a terrible, terrible dilution of their frontline strength. The US, by contrast, has managed to not lose a plane um, through the simple expedient, really, of just keeping their aircraft out of the way. Um, Port Moresby did a grand job of surviving the pummeling it received and taking quite a few of its attackers down. And the defence put up by the aircraft carrier and its destroyers was just phenomenal. I don't know if they'll be that lucky later in the campaign, but all I can say is the Japanese are looking far less terrifying than they were at the beginning of the turn. Still formidable, but they, they have suffered a serious tactical setback. The US is not yet strong enough to take advantage of that in a serious way, and their efforts are going to be hampered by the fact that they can base no fresh aircraft on Port Moresby at the beginning of the next turn. The base has just been too badly damaged. Um, and there is some value in the raid the Japanese threw against it. They basically wiped it off the map for one turn. And the US are going to have congestion problems because they do have another carrier in reserve, which is great. They can fill out their places, but but their fighters are dreadfully short legged, especially the P-39. So we could base them at Espiritu Santo, but that doesn't really help Port Moresby. So the US has a fair share of tactical headaches, but I'm going to leave it there for now. Um, I hope this has given you a good idea of how um, this game works in practice and, and um, it would be interesting to see how it plays out in a future turn. Un unfortunately, I may have to give up this table space tomorrow, so if that does happen, I'll have no choice but to clear this away. But I hope the few turns that I've played give you an idea of how the game is structured and how it works. If you would like to see a complete playthrough from start to finish, please do let me know. If I do retain the use of this table tomorrow, I will do one anyway, but unfortunately I can't make any promises. But fingers massively crossed anyway. Most importantly, thank you so much for your company as always. It's a pleasure having you guys along. Um, I always welcome any comments, feedback, tactical thoughts. It's what the hobby is all about. So thank you again for tuning in and um, goodbye until next time.